hello students welcome back to the discussion of principles and chemical applications of thermodynamics and today we are going to talk about chemical potential of real systems and in this connection i am going to introduce to you the concept of activity as an effective concentration in real systems now let us first start by discussing the chemical potential of a real gas for an ideal gas we already know how to write down its chemical potential at a temperature t and pressure p where you have mu not at t that is the chemical potential of the ideal gas at standard pressure at a temperature t plus an additional contribution coming that depends on the ratio p by p not now the argument is i would like to preserve this form of the equation even for a real gas so in that case mu tp would be written once again as mu not t plus rt ln of some ratio where instead of p which appeared for an ideal gas i am going to introduce a new quantity which is an analog of pressure here for the real gas and i will call it the fugacity of the real gas now so obviously the question comes what would be the definition of fugacity fugacity is defined to be proportional to the pressure and the proportionality constant is known as phi or the fugacity coefficient obviously phi depends on temperature pressure and identity of the gas and also phi is an indicator of the magnitude of deviation of the behavior of the real gas from ideality so as you understand then with this introduction of the concept of fugacity i can very easily compare these two equations and write down that mu of the real gas at a given temperature and pressure that would be nothing but mu not of t plus rt ln phi p by p not now this gives me that the chemical potential of the real gas is equal to the chemical potential of the ideal gas under identical conditions of temperature and pressure plus a term which indicates what would be the contribution to chemical potential because of the existence of deviation from ideality now if i look at the plot of chemical potential as a function of pressure i understand that this for an ideal gas the mu is dependent on ln p therefore this is what is shown as this logarithmic curve that is given here which is for the ideal gas and as you understand at p goes to 0 this curve goes to minus infinity now when you look at this expression you understand that for a real gas in addition to the logarithmic variation of the ideal gas part there will be an additional part which is given by rt ln phi and so depending on the value of phi for a real gas the chemical potential will either so show positive or negative deviation and here we have plotted in this curve what happens to the chemical potential of the real gas as a function of pressure at a given temperature now let us try and understand the different regions 
of pressure at which the chemical potential is undergoing a deviation from the ideal gas behavior. So first let us consider the limit of negligible interaction where the pressure is very low and we are somewhere in this region where you see that the ideal gas and the real gas will have nearly superimposable values of chemical potential. And here I must be having phi leading to limiting to 1 as a result of which the fugacity is approximately equal to pressure. But if I am at an intermediate pressures, in that case I would expect that the molecules constituting the uh, real gas will be having attractive interactions dominating the intermolecular interaction and under such condition phi is found to be less than 1 and then this would mean that the fugacity would be less than p. Now if the fugacity is less than p and phi is less than 1 and then you see that in this intermediate region I will have the real gas chemical potential becoming less than that of the ideal gas. Now at very high pressures when the molecules of the real gas are forced to stay in close vicinity of each other, it is under that condition that phi would be greater than 1 and f would be greater than p and this is this region that we have shown in the picture. Now that we have introduced the concept of fugacity, for practical applications I would need to determine the fugacity of a real gas to be able to use this expression effectively. In order to do so, let us take up a very simple exercise whereby we understand that for any gas, ideal or real, I can write down the d mu of this gas is equal to minus Sm dt plus Vm dp. Therefore, under isothermal conditions, I should be able to write this expression where dt being equal to 0, I have taken, I have removed this expression and now I am integrating from an initial value of pressure P prime to a final value of pressure P whereby the value of mu goes from this value to this value. Now this basically tells me that, that this integral that I have here will be equal to this difference in the chemical potentials as the pressure changes from P prime to P and if I use the definition of mu at a given pressure in terms of fugacity then I must be able to write down that this integral is now related to RT ln F by F prime. Here I am using the notation that when the gas is present at a pressure P prime its fugacity is F prime and when it is present as at a pressure P its fugacity is F. Now with this expression in mind let me go ahead and think of how I will rewrite this expression for an ideal gas. For an ideal gas the molar volume of the ideal gas is Vm ideal. So if I integrate Vm ideal dp from pressure P prime to P what I should be getting is RT ln P prime by P and this is because for an ideal gas the fugacity is equal to its pressure. For a real gas I will be once again retaining the expression that I have uh, derived in the previous uh, slide. Now I can use these two expressions and evaluate 
this integral now which now turns out to be rt ln f by f prime into p prime by p in the limit of p prime going to 0 i know that f prime can be replaced by p prime and therefore i can simplify this integral to an expression like this so since f prime is equal to p prime therefore i have eliminated these two terms and all i have on the right hand side is the ratio f by p now let me concentrate on the integrand that appears on the left hand side i understand that the molar volume of the ideal gas is related to temperature and pressure as rt by p i can also write down the molar volume of the real gas as rt by p into z where z is the compression factor which is usually measured in experiments and if i use these two definitions in the expression uh, of the integrand here what should i get i must be getting the expression that i have written down here now in this expression as you see rt appears on both sides of the equation so i can eliminate it by dividing on both sides by rt and the resultant expression turns out to be this so now what you have here is an expression that you can use to determine the value of the fugacity coefficient phi so if i need to determine phi what is it that i need to know if i know for the given ideal gas z the compression factor as a function of pressure i should be able to find out the left hand side here and hence find out ln phi therefore this is a summary of how the fugacity of a real gas can be determined let us take this example of a van der waals gas in the case of a van der waals gas extensive experimental measurement of the compression factor is available in the literature and as you see that here i am presenting the compression factor as a function of pressure of the gas and as expected z is equal to 1 for an ideal gas or a perfect gas and z is having a value very very different from 1 as you see from this curve at for h2 or this curve for ethane or this curve for methane now how do i use this information to find out phi if you use this expression and find out phi this is typically how fugacity coefficient varies with pressure at different temperatures please note that here i am plotting a reduced pressure where the each value of pressure has been divided by the critical pressure of the van der waals gas and as you see that here i have the fugacity coefficients at higher value of pressure like 20 40 80 or 100 to be greater than 1 now if i go back to this picture and see i am actually looking at situations where i have z greater than 1 now if i have z greater than 1 this means that the value of this integrand is going to be positive and therefore i would understand the value of the integral between some pressures positive pressures p and p prime are also going to be positive and therefore in the region of pressure highlighted in this uh, figure z is greater than 1 which tells me that phi should 
also be greater than 1. Now, if I look into this region, I zoom into this region where z is less than 1 for some va intermediate values of pressure, then the corresponding plot of fugacity coefficient would look something like this. Now, if z is less than 1 for a certain range of pressure, then I understand that this integrand for some range of pressure can be negative. And if that is so, if that is so, then L and phi can be less than 1, can be less than 0 and phi would be less than 1. So, as you see then, in the case of a real gas, it is indeed possible to retain the expression for chemical potential in a form that mimics the expression for chemical potential. And with this, we have introduced the concept of a fugacity. And the fugacity of the real gas is nothing but phi into the pressure of the gas. And phi is a quantity which shows the deviation from ideality and it can be determined from experimental observations. Now, with this idea in, the, in our mind, let me then introduce the concept of activity in relation to writing down chemical potential of a real system. And here is how we define the activity. The activity A is an effective concentration in a real system that preserves the expression for the chemical potential. There and the example that we have discussed in detail is that of an ideal gas. So, since the ideal gas can be exactly written down for its chemical potential in this form, what we have done is we have shown that for a real gas, we can preserve this analytical form by introducing this quantity fugacity. And he, here, fugacity plays the role of an effective concentration or the activity in the case of real gases. So, in general, if I have any system in mind, then for that system, I will write down mu at a given temperature and pressure that is going to be mu naught t plus rt ln a. And as you see, a is playing the role of concentration or in this case the mole fraction of an ideal gas. Now, we next go back to our discussion of solute and solvent in a solution. Now, in general, I can write down the solvent activity by considering the expression for the solvent chemical potential. So, mu A is equal to mu A star plus RT ln P A by P A star. This is an expression that we have already derived and here mu A star and P A star correspond to the chemical potential of the pure substance A and the partial pressure of the vapor phase of A in its pure state that is in equilibrium with its liquid state. Similarly, the solute activity can also be written in an analogous manner. Now, if I have an ideal solution, I know that mu A can be written down as mu A star plus RT ln XA. For a real solution, I am going to replace mu A as mu A star plus RT ln into the activity of A. Now, if I compare this expression to this expression, I understand the activity of A must be the ratio of the partial pressure of the of vapor A over the real solution containing both A and B. And I am taking a ratio of P A to P A star when only the pure solvent A was present 
and there was no solute B. If my solvent is an ideal solution, then I understand that the A can be replaced by X. But in general for a real solution, A would be proportional to XA, but the proportionality constant is the activity coefficient which will tell us how much the real solution would deviate from the ideal solution behavior. Now going back to the solute activity, I understand that in an ideal dilute solution, the solute would obey the Henry's law. And therefore, in, a, in the case of a real solution, I would write down the chemical potential of the solute as mu B naught plus RT ln AB, where once again AB is PB by KB. So, this is the situation where I have the partial pressure exerted by the solute in the vapor phase when it is in contact with the real solution A plus B. And here once again the activity is given in terms of gamma B into XB. As you understand if I had an ideal dilute solution this ratio would have been replaced by XB. But in a real solution this XB will have a prefactor showing the deviation from the ideal behavior and here the gamma B represents the activity coefficient for the solute. Now let me take an example of how to calculate the activity of a solvent. So I am considering this solution of chloroform in acetone at 25 degrees centigrade. And I also have the information with me that when chloroform is present in a pure state, then the vapor pressure in its pure phase is 36.4 kilopascal at 25 degrees centigrade. Now, at this temperature, we have measured the partial pressure of chloroform in the vapor phase to be 4.7 kilopascal when the mole fraction of chloroform in the solution is 0.2. Now, if in this case I have chloroform as the solvent, in that case what is going to be the activity of chloroform? The activity of chloroform is going to be the ratio of the measured partial pressure of chloroform divided by the partial pressure of chloroform in its pure phase. So, I am going to replace by PC the measured value over here and I am going to replace PC star by the value given here and if you calculate this ratio that turns out to be 0 0.13. Now can I find out the activity coefficient? The answer is yes. If I know the activity and if I know the mole fraction then the ratio of the activity and the mole fraction gives me the gamma C. So, all I have to do is replace the value of AC as 0.13 and I know that the, acti for, uh, the activity corresponds to this mole fraction and therefore, if I divide what I get the gamma C to be equal to 0.65. Now, let us consider the other end where I have chloroform used as a solute. And in this case, I understand the Henry's law constant for chloroform is given to be 22 kilopascal. So, in, under such condition, the activity of chloroform would be the value of the partial pressure in contact with the solution divided by its Henry's law constant and therefore, this value which is nothing but 4.7 divided by 22 turns out to be 0 0.21 and I can very easily find out the activity coefficient here 
to be equal to 1.05. Now we can further take a generalize these concepts to discuss activities of ions in solution where unlike the case simple cases that we have been discussing, we will have charges on the solute and for an electrically neutral solution, we can have cations and anions for which the molar gives free energy for the ideal solution can be written like this. Therefore, in a real solution, I understand that the molar gives free energy which would be a summation of the chemical potentials of the cation and the anion. It will have contributions from the ideal part plus a contribution coming from the deviation in ideality of the individual cation and anion. Now, in interpreting these uh, quantities, one actually finds it convenient to introduce a mean activity coefficient, which is nothing but a geometric mean of the activity coefficients of the cation and the anion respectively. And with this, the chemical potential of the cation M plus turns out to be the its value in the ideal solution plus the contribution of the cation in a real situation. And here is the expression for the chemical potential of the anion, which once again preserves the form that in a real system, the chemical potential is going to be the ideal contribution plus a contribution coming from the deviation in ideality. And of course, application of the mean activity coefficient requires that these mean activity coefficients should be measurable for a given ionic solution and the debye huckel limiting law tells you how to find out the mean activity coefficient at very low concentration of these electrolyte solution. In terms of the known coefficient A, which is whose value is uh, given for an aqueous solution at a given temperature. And also in terms of what is known as an ionic strength. And if you know the composition of your cation and the anion and the charge numbers on them and the molality of the uh, ionic solution, you should be able to find out I. And then by using the debye huckel limiting law, one can find out the mean activity coefficient. I would conclude today's lecture by saying that we have introduced to you how to write down the chemical potential of a real system, whether it is a real gas or a real liquid or a mixture of real gases or a mixture of real liquids forming a real solution or an ideal solution or if I have a solution where the solute is nonpolar or ionic. In the next lectures, we will see how we use these concepts to describe the thermodynamics of chemical equilibrium and electrochemical equilibrium. Thank you.